Praise God. Hallelujah. Now, I'm preaching and got, I got my, I'm, in, I'm in an empty room here. So you be pulling on me uh, to share what the, what the Lord wants me to share. All right, let's go to Habakkuk 2. Now we're shifting gears. Let's go to Habakkuk 2. Anything good can come out of Habakkuk. I wanted to give you some good news uh, before I give you some uh, sober news. Now, we, we started with Isaiah 60. Arise, shine, for your light has come. The glory of the Lord has risen upon you. And, you know, no matter what happens, that's still true. Habakkuk 2.14 says, For the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. God's plan and purpose will be fulfilled. You know, now we didn't hear much about it in the news lately, but this month was the 400th anniversary of the Pilgrims landing on Cape Cod. And there were 102 Pilgrims. Um, most of them were Puritans. And there was a slight differ, uh, difference between Puritans and those who, I'm trying to think, what is the term? Uh, Puritans and the Separatists. The Puritans, I mean, they were all going for religious freedom. The Separatists already decided they want to separate from England. The Puritans are thinking, well, maybe we can work it out, but we're coming here. They came not for economic opportunities. Are you kidding me? There were no economic, I mean, unless you're going to hunt and trap, there were not economic opportunities in the, in the beginning, I mean, when there was not that many people there. They came for religious freedom. They came to preach the gospel. We didn't hear much about that. Well, after the first not even year, half of them died. Most of the women died. It was a rough, it was a rough winter. And yet I think back to that 400 years ago, that was the seeds. Now our nation wasn't founded for some time after that, but that was the seeds of this nation's founding. And you know, all of the things that have happened and transpired in those last 400 years, all of the battles, especially the Revolutionary War, Against all odds, God raised up America as the greatest nation, in my opinion, in the history of the world. Now, I was looking some things up recently. Obviously, we, I think we know China's the largest nation, has the largest military. The U.S. has the largest economy. The U.S. has the most powerful military. The U.S. has the most Christians of any nation. The U.S. funds more of the gospel going out than any other nation. And the U.S. as a country does more to help other nations than any other country. It is a, and, and as I said before, the U.S. has the greatest number of Christians. Now, the, the church, Jesus said, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. I, one of the things I was thinking about recently, I was meditating and I looked up, well, what's the biggest company? The biggest company is Walmart, 2.2 million associates. That's a, that's a lot of employees. That's the biggest corporation in the world. The, uh, the wealthiest corporation as far as cash on hand is Microsoft, which it used, to, it used to be Apple, Apple's up. But here's the thought I was meditating on. The largest, most diverse, most powerful organization on planet Earth is the, church, the true church of the Lord Jesus Christ. Christianity, there are more Christians on planet Earth than any other religion. Now, I realize not all that are, are tech, you know, called a Christian are necessarily born again. But the true church, those that have given their life to Jesus, those who have accepted, accepted him as their Lord and Savior, we, uh, we have the Holy Spirit inside of us. We have the greater one inside of us. We have 
all the privileges of being part of the body of Christ. He is the head. We are the body far above all principality, power, might, dominion, and every name that is named. We need to exercise our authority. This verse in Habakkuk says the earth is going to be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord. In Acts chapter 2, when Peter stood up to preach on the day of Pentecost, after there was a moving of the Spirit, there was a special manifestation, uh, a sound as a rushing mighty wind filled the house, And Peter got up and preached from Joel, talking about uh, in the last days, you know, God will pour out his spirit on all flesh. And then it goes on to say, verse 21 of Acts chapter 2, in that context of the last days, and believe me, that was the beginning of the last days. We are at the latter part of the last days. He said that, and whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. I'm telling you, there is going to be a great revival. And matter of fact, there is a great revival going on in many parts of the world. And no matter what happens, the church is not going to be shut down. Not the true church. The church, the devil's been trying to wipe the church out uh, for 2,000 years. People have been trying to, uh, I mean, the persecution, uh, even now worldwide, Christianity is the most persecuted religion by far, and that's a fact, and you can, you can look that up. But we, even though our kingdom is not of this world, Jesus said the gates of hell will not prevail against it. See, there, we are in a spiritual warfare. Now, I want you to go to me, uh, go with me to Philippians chapter 2, I just wanted to kind of use this as an introduction, some of these verses. In Philippians um, chapter 2, verse 9, Therefore God also has highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name. That at the name of Jesus, there's no other name, guys, no other name by which we must be saved. There's not like one God with different names. There is no other name. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. But says, but this verse says that at the name of that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow of those in heaven, those on earth, and those under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Every single human being that's alive on the planet, doesn't matter what race, what country, what language, every single person who has ever lived will bow their knee to, the, to Jesus and confess with their mouth that Jesus is Lord. Now, I'm not saying everybody's going to get saved. I'm not teaching universalism that God loves everybody, and so everybody's going to be saved. Because Jesus didn't teach that. Matter of fact, God doesn't forgive us because he loves us. A lot of people think, well, God's a good God, God's a loving God, God loves me, so that's why he forgave me. No, God could not forgive you because he loved you. God does love you. But, but God can't forgive us because he loves us. The only reason God could forgive us is because Jesus paid the penalty for our sins. The Lord laid on him the iniquity of us. He took the punishment we deserve. And because God is merciful, but he is just, God could not, can't forgive people just because he loves them. Because that's not justice. God has to give people what they deserve. We deserve hell. But Jesus came, paid the price, so we could be forgiven because we can't give our way, pray our way, uh, work our way to heaven. We are sinners and we're without God and we, we have gone against God and that's why Jesus came. But we have to accept him as our Lord and Savior. We have to surrender our life to him, otherwise we will go to hell. We're gonna, we'll, go to, we'll go to where the devil's going to go. If we're serving the devil and, we're, and Jesus is not our Lord and we're in the kingdom of darkness, we're going to go where they went. Now let's go to 
Uh, let's go to Matthew chapter 7. Matthew chapter 7. Here's what Jesus said, and sometimes I think we need to remind ourselves of this. I believe there's going to be a great revival. I believe multitudes are coming into the kingdom of God, but, but let me clarify, I do not believe that everyone's going to be saved. I don't even necessarily believe that the majority of people are going to be saved. And I base that based on what Jesus said. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 7, very clear, you don't have to be a Greek scholar to understand this. Matthew 7, verse 13, he said, Enter by the narrow gate. If you've ever had a fenced-in yard, you know, hopefully you had at least one or, or, or two gates. If you have a gate, you know, a typical gate probably is three feet wide. Uh, if you have a riding lawnmower, you need a gate wider than three feet wide. I'll tell you that right now. Uh, and if you're going to bring, if you want to try to put a big vehicle in, a camper or something in your backyard, a three-foot wide gate is not going to cover it. Jesus said, enter by the narrow gate. Wouldn't you think the, the, gates, uh, the gate to life would be the biggest gate around? Je That's not what Jesus said. He said, enter by the narrow gate, for wide is the gate. Let's just say it's a big gate. And broad is the way that leads to destruction. We could say hell. And there are many who go in by it. So there is a wide, large gate that leads to destruction. It leads to hell. And many people are going in that gate. Then he goes on to say in verse 14, because narrow is the gate and difficult is the way which leads to life and there are few who find it. Now, I don't see how we can interpret this any other way than to say there are likely going to be more people in hell than in heaven. And just because you think you're a good person because uh, you haven't killed anybody, that you're not perfect, but you're a good person and you're going to go to heaven. Jesus didn't say that's how you can get to heaven. The only way to get to heaven is through Jesus. Now, this message has gone a little different way than I thought. So obviously, at least one person or more is or will be watching this. And you, and, and you, need, you need Jesus. You need salvation. Maybe you even think you're a Christian and you're not. You need to know that you know. And I'm telling you, when you give your life to Jesus... You know, I mean, something happens. And I'm not talking about a feeling or necessarily an experience, but something happens when you really give your life to Jesus. Your life is forever changed. You can't have eternal life come into you. You can't be born again. You can't have the Spirit of God come inside of you and your life just continue on the way it is. It's impossible. I mean, it's the, the greatest miracle, greater than raising the dead, greater than growing a limb out. I mean, where there's no limb and a, God grows out an arm or a leg, the greatest miracle is when a person gives their life to Jesus and is born again, and they're translated out of the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light. So if you don't know if Jesus is your Lord and Savior, you want to surrender your life to him. Without him, you're on your way to hell, but you want eternal life. You want not just to go to heaven. You want to have eternal life now. You want to have the life of God, the peace of God, the love of God in your life, his, all of his benefits, but a relationship with him. So pray this after me. Say, dear God, I come to you in the name of Jesus. Your word says that whoever would call on the name of the Lord would be saved. Lord Jesus, I'm calling on your name. I believe that you're the son of God. I believe that you died for my sins. And I believe that God the Father raised you from the dead. Today, I ask you to forgive me. I accept you into my life, into my heart. Be my Lord. Be my Savior. Take control of my life. Forgive me of my sins and make me a new person. 
And I thank you for doing it, Lord. I thank you for accepting me and making me whole, making me new in Jesus' name. If you prayed that prayer and meant it, you believed in your heart and you confessed it with your mouth, then according to the word of God, you are saved. You are a believer. So please make some comments, write us, text us, email the church office, office at AbundantLifeFamily.Church. We will give you some information to help you get started in your life with God. Amen. Praise God. All right. Um, I wanted to just start today letting us see that the plan of God is going to be fulfilled. That God's uh, glory, the knowledge of the glory of the Lord will fulfill the earth as the waters cover the sea. There will be a a great revival. God will pour out his spirit on, on all flesh. And that whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. But see, not everyone wants to call on the name of the Lord. There may have been somebody who listened to what I'm saying and think, well, I don't believe that. I'm not, I'm not going to surrender my life to Jesus. I don't believe that Jesus is the only way. I don't believe that, that you know, that's the only way to get to heaven. I think I'm a pretty good person and I don't think I'm going to hell because God's a good God and he wouldn't send anyone to hell. Well, God doesn't send anyone to hell, but you can send yourself. God gave you the way out and that's Jesus. And if you reject Jesus, you will spend eternity in hell. I guarantee you that. Now, here's, here's what I want to talk about today. I want to talk about standing in the gap. Standing in the gap. 19 days ago, we had an election in this country. And on election night, if you went to bed around midnight, virtually everywhere, Donald Trump was leading by a large margin. And then if you woke up in the morning, something happened. That was 19 days ago that we had the election. And... I haven't, I haven't really said anything political. Um, the Sunday before the election, I, I shared some things, but since then I have not said anything. And I wanted to share some things. I'm going to call this standing in the gap. The, the election process, even though everywhere you see on social media, at least on Facebook, it seems like almost every post it says, Joe Biden is president-elect, or you know something to that effect. That's, that is more irritating to me than getting a phone call about getting an extended warranty for my car. Uh, you know what it is? It's, it's a form of manipulation or brainwashing. Now, they'll put the facts in there. Okay, these agencies have called the election, blah, 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 blah. Here's the bottom line. First off, there's a process of the election, which I think many of you know. The election day is part of that process, obviously, And there has been no concession, and and that is not something that's in the Constitution. You have to have to concede. I mean, eventually you may have to. There is a deadline coming up December eighth, and that is a deadline for recounts and and uh, courts things being contested in the court. That so that's sixteen days from today. December eighth is the deadline. 35 days from the election, 16 days from today. Not until December 14th do the electors actually meet. So that's in 22 days. So 16 days for the, uh, the deadline for uh, recounts in court contest to be decided. 22 days before the electors even meet. Then there's the receipt of ballots, December 23rd. Then Congress counts the ballots on January 6th. And if all of that goes through, and there's provisions if that doesn't go through, other other options, then on January 20th is Inauguration Day, uh, which is basically uh, 59 days from now. Now, just as a little history, so we're at the 19th day mark right now. Now, Al Gore took 37 days to concede to Bush in 2000. Okay, so we're at 16, uh, or we're at 19 days from the election. Al Gore did not concede for 37 days. Okay. Now, there was only one state in play. Al Gore, who was declared the president, did not become uh, the president. Now, as some of you know, there is a, there has been, uh, well, if you watch the, the mainstream media, it's all said and done. And naturally speaking, it kind of looks that way. 
But you've got Sidney Powell, a lawyer, and if you look up the background, these are not just fly-by-night people. Rudy Giuliani, even though they're painting him, making him look like a buffoon, these are sharp people. However the media is trying to spin it, you look up the background of what Judy, Rudy Giuliani did as a young man in New York coming against the mob families and getting them convicted and cleaning up some of the garbage in that, in that city. These are not slouches. They, are, they believe that this election was stolen. Now, I can't prove it. I don't have any proof. All I know is in my spirit, and I'm not saying thus saith the Lord, in my spirit, I do not believe that Donald Trump lost. I could be wrong. I'm not infallible. I'm not saying the Lord told me that. I'm just saying it's still, even after this, I, I don't believe it. Now, here's what's going to happen. And I said this the, the Sunday before election. I said, whoever is inaugurated on January 20th, by the time that happens, and someone, you know, I mean, if nothing takes place between now and then, that is the president. But until January 20th, Donald Trump is still the president. And he may still be the president after January 20th. We'll see about that. But we need to stand in the gap, church. We need to pray. Now, here's something. Here's something that Randall Greer, now Randall Greer's coming to our church in three weeks. Uh, this is something that he shared. He shared uh, the most recent post he had was from a, Z, a quote from Ezekiel 22, verse 30. So I want to go there. Ezekiel uh, 22, verse 30. Uh, says, so I sought for a man among them who would make a wall and stand in the gap before me on behalf of the land that I should not destroy it, but I found no one. I found no one. I wish I could say that's an encouraging word. God is looking for people to stand in the gap. Now here's what Randall Greer said. He said, over several days... I kept being impressed with the above verse, which I just read, that he was looking for one person to stand in the gap to stop the evil in the land. Fervent Holy Spirit prayer, led prayer, uh, is what we need. We stand on the verge of an onslaught of evil like we have never known. And you know what? I believe that. It is a spiritual battle. Between the church and evil, it is not just about the election. This is not a time to play. It is a time to fast and pray in intercession and supplication for our nation and indeed the world. Now, here's something that, uh, to me, that's very, that's very sobering. The fact that God would give him a scripture that says I'm seeking for a man to stand in the gap that I won't destroy, uh, basically the things won't go in the wrong direction, and I found none, uh, that's not real comforting to me. I feel the next two to three weeks is a critical time. Now, this may seem like two messages, and the reason I started with some of these verses about revival, the earth being filled with the knowledge of the glory, about arise, shine, your light has come, the glory of the Lord risen upon you, is because no matter what happens, the plan of God is going to be fulfilled, okay? But I believe that we have a window of time. It is going to take... Really, it's going to take the hand of God, but we have, it's not just us waiting to see what God does. Like the battle is the Lord, so okay, Lord, just do your thing. You know, we're, we're believing with you. We have got to pray and exercise our authority. It would seem without a, I mean, there's, here's, here's one, of, one of two things going to happen. Okay, either Joe Biden's going to be the president or Donald Trump's going to be the president. If there was no fraud, and I think I think anyone, come on, 
probably every election there's fraud. But let's just say if there was no massive fraud, then Joe Biden's going to be the president. Because if there's no massive fraud, there's not going to be able to prove it. Uh, now, on the other hand, if there was massive fraud, it doesn't mean you, would, you may not be able to prove it. So if, if there's massive fraud, but you cannot prove it, or the courts decide differently, then Joe Biden will be the president. Now, if there's massive fraud, and you have people saying that we absolutely have proof, someone like Sidney Powell, the woman lawyer, says, I don't take a case unless I think I can win it, unless I have the proof. They are saying that this and again, I, I have a tendency to believe this, but I, you know, I'm, hey, I'm infallible. I'm not the, you know, the Pope's infallible too, by the way, uh, especially this Pope. We, we don't, we don't know. We see, Paul, and this is not a statement of unbelief. Paul said, we see, he said, he said, we, including himself, see through a glass darkly. We have the word of God. We have the witness of the Spirit, unless, unless we have a word from the Lord. Now, I know m many have had words from the Lord, but we cannot live our life based on a word from other people. Now, I'm, here I'm sharing you know, what the Lord's put on Randall Greer, but he's not, saying, he's not saying one way or another. He's saying this is how the Lord's instructing me to pray. Now, one of the things he said in, in a, a post before this, and he, who knows, he may talk about this when he comes, he said the Lord gave him, and I'm going to, I'm going to turn there. He said in 2 Chronicles 20, the entire 20th chapter, God gave him that as a pattern to pray. And that bears witness with me. And I don't think I'm going to take the time to uh, read it. I did read through it uh, again today, this morning. But the, the people, well, I'll read a little bit of it. The people of Moab and the people of Ammon and others with them, besides the Ammonites, came to battle against Jehoshaphat. And it was a great multitude coming against them. And Jeho Jehoshaphat feared and set himself to seek the Lord. And he proclaimed a fast throughout all Judah. So Judah gathered together to ask help from the Lord. And from all the cities of Judah, they came to seek the Lord. Now, verse 6 says, O Lord God of our fathers, are you not God in heaven? And do you not rule over all the kingdoms of the nations? And in your hand is there not power and might so that no one is able to withstand you? Now, let's go down to verse 12. O our God, will you not judge them? For we have no power against this great multitude that is coming against us, nor do we know what to do, but our eyes are upon you. Now, basically, they're in a situation that in the natural did not look good. But they went to praying and seeking God and fasting. Verse 13 says, Now all Judah with their little ones, their wives, and their children stood before the Lord. Now, here is... Here is the thing, you know, the verse that said, God sought for a man among them to stand in the gap, and I found none. Verse 14 says, Then the Spirit of the Lord came upon Jehaziel, the son of Zechariah. He was a Levite. And then he got up by the Spirit of God and said, Do not be afraid nor dismayed because of this great multitude, for the battle is not yours but the Lord's. You will not need to fight in this battle. Position yourself, stand still and see, I'm in verse 17, the salvation of the Lord who is with you. Do not fear or be dismayed. Go out against them, for the Lord is with you. And Jehoshaphat bowed his head with his face to the ground, and all Judah and all the inhabitants of Jerusalem bowed before the Lord, worshiping the Lord. Then the Levites and the children of the Korthites and the uh, Korites stood up to praise the Lord God of Israel with voices loud and high. They began to not only pray, they began to worship God. And it says, So they rose early in the morning, went out into the wilderness of Tekoa, and as they went out, Jehoshaphat stood and said, Hear me, O Judah, and you inhabitants of Jerusalem. Believe the Lord your God and you'll be established. Believe his prophets and you'll prosper. Anyway, now in this particular case, it looked impossible 
they prayed, they sought the Lord. Someone stood up and took authority and decreed things under the anointing. It wasn't like they just said, hey, I'm going to decide to do this. The Spirit of the Lord came upon Jehaziel, and he set some things in motion. We need, and I, I believe many of us, we've been doing this, we need to seek God, especially these next few weeks, maybe, as I said even before, even all the way till the election and beyond. We need to spend some serious time not only praying in the Spirit, not just making confessions, praying in the Spirit, but taking authority over the power of the devil. Satan is trying to take over our country. Now, let me just clarify something here. It's not about Democrats and Republicans. In America... And in the world, there are two kingdoms. Two. I'm not talking about nations. I'm not talking about religions. I'm I'm talking about, biblically, there are only two kingdoms. There's the kingdom of God or the kingdom of light, the kingdom of righteousness, and there is the kingdom of darkness. There are Democrats in the kingdom of darkness, and there are Republicans in the kingdom of darkness. There are Republicans in the kingdom of light, and I'm sure there are Democrats in the kingdom of light. Now, if we look at the platforms, you know, which you can look that up, the Republican platform, I'm not saying it's perfect, is more biblical than the Democratic platform. I'm not saying there's nothing good in the Democratic platform, but there's a lot of things that are blatantly against the Word of God. So we've got, what we're we're in, as Randall Griff said, it's not just about the election. It is a battle for good and evil. And again, don't don't think it's just Democrat and Republican. It's good and evil. It's light and darkness. It's righteousness and unrighteousness. There are only two kingdoms. And now see, unfortunately, there are many people who are in the kingdom of light because they've given their life to Jesus and they've been born again, but they've never renewed their minds. And so they think more in line with the kingdom of darkness. They're really saved. They really love God, but their minds are unrenewed. Guys, there is wickedness in all both parties and, and liber- I'm sure libertarians and other, other you know, the Green Party or whatever, whatever these other smaller parties are, there's wickedness in all of them. We are for righteousness. We are for the will of God being done. Now, in Ephesians, or in 1 Timothy 2, let's turn to 1 Timothy 2. And some of, a lot of this is nothing, is nothing new. We've heard this before, we know this, but we need to remind ourselves of it. We are told, oops, I'm in the wrong place here. 1 Timothy, chapter 2, verses 1 through 5. All right, let me find it. First Timothy, but I wish I could hear a few amens, but I just have to hear it by faith. Uh, first Timothy 2, 1 through 5 says, Therefore I exhort first of all that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men, for kings and all who are in authority or all who are in a prominent place, be, uh, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and reverence. So we know that through our prayers for those in authority and through us taking our authority in Christ that we can cause the situation, let's say, in our country and in the world to be more favorable to the preaching of the gospel. It says, For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior who desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all. Now, in Ephesians 6, it talks about taking on the whole armor of God, and we've referred to that many times before, that we might be able to stand against the wiles and the schemes 
of the devil. And it talks about different powers, principalities, powers, uh, rulers of the darkness of this world, spiritual wickedness in high places. The Bible says we do not wrestle against flesh and blood. Guys, this is a spiritual battle for the heart and soul of our nation. If there was massive fraud, if there was through the machines and especially through the software as well as through some of the ballots, if this election was stolen, then it did not happen with just one or two people doing something illegal and immoral. It would be a massive fraud. Massive fraud. It would be, in a sense, the crime of the century. Now, if, and I'm saying if, even though I think, I, I think it is the case, but again, I, no one's infallible. If that is the case, and if Joe Biden becomes president, but, it was, but he really did not get the, not only the popular vote, but the uh, electoral votes, then we will probably never, ever have another Republican president. And some people would think, oh, that's great, you know. I'm all for the, the will of the people. That whoever legally wins, wins. But if there is massive fraud, it needs to be exposed. People need to go to jail. They need to go to prison uh, see, this is the this is the battle for our nation, and we guys. Again, I read some of the beginning verses because no matter what happens, we're not going to throw in the towel. But I am not willing. Meaning, when I'm, in other words, whatever happens, we're going to go on. We have to go on. We, what other alternatives we have? But I think that to just think, well, whatever happens, happens. We have got to make a stand. We have got to pray. We have got to intercede. And it's not just all about the legal case. I think if, we, if you read Second Chronicles 20, you read through the whole thing, we need either the judgment of God to fall. We need wickedness and corruption to be exposed. We need, we need people that were involved. I mean, it's a felony to be... Uh, falsifying elections knowingly and changing ballots that would not be qualified under the law and making them qualified or fabricating ballots or or if they have the possibility of flipping you know we've heard, it's not like we've never heard this before where where votes are given for one person and then it flips we've haven't y'all heard stories of where someone's actually voting and they see on a screen and then right before their eyes their vote just flips and we, we've, we've heard that in the last election. I mean, this is, this is nothing new. These things are nothing new. So we need, we need to pray and we need, we need to stand. Now let's, let's, go to, let's go and look at Ephesians. And we're going to close with that, I think. Hallelujah. I hope you're still with me. Ephesians, Ephesians chapter 6. It's not over yet, guys. You know, the, the, the most current results, which I don't believe, are almost 80,000, or 80,000, almost 80 million votes for Biden, almost uh, 74 million votes for being said and saying that they have proof is right, you could flip it. And see, if, if that is provable, and if that is true, then this has been the biggest fraud and it just shows all the wickedness in our government god wants to root this stuff out but if we don't take our place and we don't prayer and we don't pray and use our authority it's not going to happen god is seeking for us to be those people that are going to stand in the gap so in ephesians 6 and we're going to close with this verse 10 says finally my brethren be strong in the lord and the power of his might Put on the whole armor of God. And you know, in this day, regardless of what happens, I'm, I'm not prophesying this. Jesus said if you live godly in Christ Jesus, you're going to suffer persecution. If Trump gets in office, it goes a second term, or if Biden does, 
Either way, there's going to be in continued increased persecution in the church. And don't get fearful. Like my son's here. I know he is, you know, my grandson. You know, you, when you have a family and you're younger, don't get fearful. Other people over the course of time have been through things. We are overcomers. No weapon formed against us shall prosper. We have authority over all the power of the enemy, but we have got to get in the spirit and take our place. It is not a natural warfare. So put on the whole armor of God that you'll be able to stand against the wiles or the schemings of the devil, for we don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, Take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day. And having done all to stand, stand. Therefore, having girded your waist with truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace, says, above all, take the shield of faith with which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit and being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints. Hallelujah. Father, right now in the name of Jesus, we pray for our country. We pray that your will will be done in this election. Lord, I pray that Lord, any, any, uh, wickedness, evil, dishonesty, votes being added, votes being thrown away, votes being flipped. Lord, we thank you that you are exposing corruption. You are exposing corruption. We thank you that you, your kingdom, the kingdom of God will prevail. Lord, we thank you. I thank you, Father, for our president. We pray for Donald Trump. We thank you for strengthening him. We thank you for giving him uh, protecting and we thank you for uh, we speak strength to his inner man and I thank you Father God for uh, for his family we thank you for the, all those in positions of authority Lord that you're giving them supernatural wisdom we pray especially for Rudy Giuliani and Sidney Powell as they are getting ready to present their case Lord and Lord we thank you for your hand we we declare that the purposes of God are being accomplished that Satan will not prevail against the church, that this country is not being taken over by the devil in the name of Jesus. And I know that's going to make some people mad. Well, I'm sorry. Uh, I, we're, we're, we're not going to let the devil take over. And we're not going to let wickedness and godliness. Lord, we, we thank you for revival. We thank you for pouring out your spirit. We thank you for causing the true church the true remnant church, Lord, spirit-filled and non-spirit-filled, to come together to recognize that we're on the same team, to work together, to pray together. We thank you for revival in our country and in the world. We thank you for an awakening. We thank you that people are awake, Lord, and I thank you that, that, that we are waking up and we are, we are taking our positions that you've placed us in, Lord, seriously. We are standing in the gap for the land. We're seeking you. And Lord, I thank you for helping us to pray this thing through and to teach us how to pray, show us how to pray, show us how to use our authority. And we thank you for it, Father. We thank you for your will being done as we take our place. And we purpose to these next two or three weeks, especially to continue to pray and continue to stand and Lord, we just thank you for your will being done in our lives and in our church. Amen. I hope you got something out of that. I hope, I hope you got some encouragement. Guys, we win. Greater is he than, that's in us than he that's in the world. No weapon formed against us shall prosper. We are overcomers. Amen. We overcome. So praise the Lord. Well, thank you for, for tuning in. Uh, ho hopefully, if you, you, know, you, you gave in the offering today, Next Sunday, we're meeting in person to praise the Lord, to worship. It's going to be wonderful. We love you and God bless you and we'll see you soon. Bye-bye.